this one honestly is a very, very hard question, and that is, what is your name? How is it spelled? <laughs> My name is uh, Carver Gayton. First name is spelled C-A-R-V-E-R. -E uh, the last name Gayton is G-A-Y-T-O-N. Right. And I'm just gonna, I'll probably put longtime friend or something like that on, underneath. Yeah, is that I, think, okay? I, I think that's a proper, uh, yeah, okay. saying I'm a longtime friend. Okay, right. great. Um, <coughs> so, how do you know Homer Harris? When did you meet him and so on? Well, I met Homer Harris in 1955, but I knew of Homer Harris uh, many years before that. Uh, my uncles had gone to, to Garfield High School with him, about th three of my uncles. And my, my parents knew him and talked about him, you know, quite a bit. And then, having been a graduate of Garfield High School, I was at Garfield and I would look at the trophy cases and the, the yearbooks and I would see all these things about this unbelievable man who was not only a, you know, an outstanding athlete in so many different sports, but he was an outstanding scholar. So I had heard of Homer for for many years, you know, before I met him. In fact, I really didn't have any idea. I didn't think I'd ever have the pleasure of meeting Homer Harris, and I was uh, I was so excited and so thrilled uh, when I was um, able to meet him when he came back to town in 1955 because I didn't have any idea he was going to come back. Wow, that's great. <coughs> so, in your own words, can you describe what kind of a person he is? That's kind of difficult to say what kind of person Homer is. Um, Homer is a pretty self-effacing kind of individual. He doesn't talk you know, a great deal about himself. Uh, he doesn't get you know, that involved uh, in community kinds of things. Doesn't, you know, it's, it's hard to really tell what kind of politics uh, he has. Uh, but he's the kind of person that really is focused on what he wants to accomplish. And you know of Homer Harris based on the kinds of things he does rather than what he, what he says. And so he's, a, he's an individual who you know, is, a, is a leader by example. I mean, he is the, the epitome of, um, uh, of, of that kind of leadership. You know, like I said, he's an outstanding scholar, he's a, uh, a physician, uh, an athlete, uh, one of the best athletes ever to come out of uh, Garfield High School in so many different sports. He excelled in, in college. And uh, if you talk with Homer, he doesn't talk a great deal about those kinds of things, uh, but you would know about him. And so um, he's the, a different kind of leader than what most people think of. Excellent. Um, <coughs> As you know, were you at the dedication, by the way? Yes, uh, the dedication of the Homer Harris Park, I was invited uh, to be there. And in fact, I, I was really proud of the fact that uh, I was asked to, to say a few words about Homer. Excellent. Um, in your opinion, what does a $1.3 million donation to name the park after Homer Harris, what, what does that say about Homer Harris? Naming the, the park after Homer Harris, I think, is, is something that is long overdue. Um, like I said, I've known of Homer and, and so many of the friends that I grew up with, uh, athletes, uh, outstanding scholars, people who've gone into a variety of uh, professions, uh, many of whom were inspired by, by Homer. I just think uh, it's you know it's uh, it's it, it's time has come, and I just thought it was uh, you know it was wonderful. It seems, as I recall, uh, there were some discussions about you know a park or a facility in the city being named after Homer back about uh, 30 years ago, and the feedback that I got was that uh, when this was first brought up, Homer wasn't that enthusiastic about it because he still, you know, saw himself as a young man. He wasn't prepared to have anything named after him. So it, it really is long overdue in terms of um, what he's done for this, uh, for this community in terms of his contributions in, in athletics, his contributions in his uh, profession, the fact that he's a, 
you know, um, you know he's a, 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 the epitome, again, of a scholar athlete. Um, he is, uh, is someone that just um, has inspired so many of us. I think it was appropriate and, again, long overdue that a park was named after him. Excellent. Uh, the only thing I would ask is <coughs> um, if you can try not to say, like I said. Okay. Because it's just it's an editing thing. Good deal. Yeah, they won't know what you said before. And okay. Um, <coughs> I don't know if you know anything about this or not, so I'm going to ask you a okay. question anyway. Maybe you've had conversations with him about it. <coughs> was it you who told me he set up a practice up in Seattle in 19, uh, 1955? Did he, have, did he run into any adversity when he's trying to set that up? It's hard to say whether or not Homer had any adversities um, when he set up his practice in 1955, at least in terms of what I know. Certainly, there are a great number of, uh, of people uh, who knew of Homer, and they knew of his achievements at Garfield, they knew of his achievements at the University of uh, Iowa, uh, they knew that he had this uh, wonderful uh, background, training background as a dermatologist. And so I think if he were just, um, you know, part of the majority community and had come out and wanted to set up a practice, he wouldn't have had any difficulty whatsoever. And uh, Quite frankly, I, have, I didn't hear anything uh, about any problems he had in setting up his practice, but in view of his background, in view of his um, talents, I can't imagine that it would have been uh, difficult you know, for him to set up a practice. Um, uh, but the fact remains that, you know, that he did. He has not uh, indicated to me that he had any difficulties uh, at all in terms of uh, establishing it, but that's something that would have to you know, come directly from Dr. Harris. Okay. <coughs> um, you probably know a little bit about this. How successful was his practice? The success of uh, Dr. Harris's practice, I think, uh, just from uh, the grapevine, just talking with people, both uh, African Americans and, and whites, uh, I don't think there's any question about the fact, at least in my mind, that he's one of the top dermatologists in Seattle, if not uh, the top dermatologist here. I, it was uh, among my friends, both black and white, there are very few that I knew of who did not go to, to Dr. Harris. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that he had a, a very, very successful practice, and, and that's all I've, uh, I've heard about it, just uh, know, great uh, compliments about the work that he does. And, and I can personally vouch for the quality of uh, dermatologist that he is from the times I've gone there. Great. Yeah, he was very professional. Very, very, very professional. Okay. From the research that we did. Okay. Thorough research. Yeah. <coughs> um, he wouldn't say that, though. I know he wouldn't. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> I mean, I <laughs> <laughs> this is why I need you to come <laughs> <in>. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Did he ever mention to you at all? And, and I know this is, I know he's talked to this, talked about this to people, but does he, did he ever mention to you at all how, how it felt to be the uh, first black captain of the U of I football team? Uh, and Big Ten, first black captain of the Big Ten? I've talked to, to Homer about him being uh, the first black captain of the University of Iowa football team and his outstanding accomplishments as the, you know, the top football player in the, in the Big Ten, you know, his, uh, I think both his uh, senior and junior year, as I can recall. Um, but whenever I talk to him about that, about his accomplishments, and you know, how proud, in certain words, how proud I was, you know, to, to know him and to know of what he had accomplished. He would always push back and say, well, Carver, uh, you know, don't talk about me. You played in the Rose Bowl for the University of Washington. He said, I didn't play in the Rose Bowl, you know, when I was at, uh, at Iowa. But that's how he would handle any kind of compliment to him. He would, he would turn it back to you about, at least in my circumstance, about what I had 
what I had accomplished. And, and it was really, it was a nice indicator of the kind uh, of person he is. I mean, he, uh, he just was not one you know, to talk about his, uh, his accomplishments. And that's not to say that, I don't think that there's any doubt about the fact that he's very proud you know, of what he has done. But he just didn't um, um, want to, to talk a great deal about it. He would turn it around back to you. <coughs> was there was there was there any see you know, part of the story and, and <coughs> a lot of this just meeting Homer for the first time right. is really hard to get out, especially because you know he doesn't know me, right? You know, uh -huh. and he, he is a he is the type of person that. You know, he's very cautious who he lets in. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Right. And uh, <coughs> and I certainly respect that, and in a lot of ways, I'm the same way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's hard to really get out of him some of the stories, some of the adversity stories, some of the things. Uh, did he have? Was there any adversities that he had to go through when he was in when he was in college and he was trying to? You know, uh, was there any? Tension about being him, him being uh, uh, the black captain. You know, were there people that didn't want him to be that, um, or were there any stories that he told you about about uh, you know perhaps not being able to stay with all his other teammates? That he, you know, when they went on the road, mm -hmm. um, did he tell you any of that stuff? Was there any of that stuff going on at all? In relation to any adversities that uh, that Homer had at the University of Iowa when he was going to school there when, when he was playing ball. Um, those adversities were not related directly to me, but uh, indirectly he did mention um, the reason why he went to the University of Iowa. And um, that related to the fact, uh, which I won't go into a great deal of detail about, but he did mention that you know, he was not really welcome you know, to go to the University of Washington. And uh, he was not really encouraged. And so, uh, in certain words, he did uh, mention that. And I think the other, probably uh, a very important reason was because uh, of the fact that um, uh, Leon Brigham, who was the uh, coach at Garfield High School um, when uh, Homer was there, he had graduated from the University of, of Iowa. And uh, he encouraged him uh, to go to the University of Iowa. But there's no question about the fact that um, Homer uh, really wanted to go to the University of Washington. He had a, a real desire to go there, but University of uh, Iowa uh, made a better offer. Awesome. Let me ask you this. <coughs> and maybe he's told you this too, because you guys are pretty close. What kind of influence did, uh, and this is off the paper, so uh -huh. I'm throwing this to you. Uh -huh. so but what kind of influence was Leon Brigham on, on uh, Homer Hill? In relation to the influence that Leon Brigham had, uh, from all that I can gather, and I, have, I haven't talked directly with Homer mm -hmm. uh, about this, but uh, from all indications, you know, Leon Brigham did have a significant um, impact on him and ultimately his decision to go to the University of uh, Iowa. Um, beyond that, I really can't address that okay. any further. I was just, I was just guessing. I was like, "Come on in." I think this is. Hi. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh -huh. I think she wants the transcript real quick. So she can cut back. Okay. We're uh. That's good. We're almost all the way through. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi. How you doing? Hi, Hi Miss Mathers. Oh, How are you? Just uh, what coming was, in. What was his father like? Because you know, I I can't find anything on his father. Was he like like about? I think he was, was like a Homer. I think he was a postman. Yeah, was he was a postman. That's all. I, that's all I really know. I know he's dead. Yeah, his his dad. He you know Homer probably was more like his dad than you know than anybody because his dad didn't talk a great deal, and um, but the thing is he had this wonderful garden. He had this wonderful garden up on uh, Helen Street, and it you know took up a, probably about a you know half an acre at least. But they had these wonderful vegetables. You know that they and other th you know, other things that they grew right there in, the, in that garden. And for the m for the most part, every time I went up there, um, uh, 
the father, Homer's father, was out there in the garden working in the garden. And he didn't, you know, he didn't uh, talk a great deal. The, w- the one that tended to talk, and I don't remember a great deal about it because the last time I had any long conversation was back in the, back in the 50s. Mm-hmm. But she was uh, obviously a very strong, uh, strong lady and had a great deal of influence. I'm, I'm obviously, I'm sure both of them had influence on him. But, yeah. uh, yeah. but she, w- she was something. My understanding, uh, from what I'm talking about, his parents were very good, good parents. Yeah. You know. That's I think he was an only child, if I recall. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, there are a lot of focuses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> right. Kids. Yeah, I've got, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> okay, let's see here. Uh, let me ask you this then. I know you can answer this one. <coughs> Why does he deserve to be called a black pioneer? Why does Homer deserve to be uh, considered a black pioneer here in Seattle? Well, for one thing, uh, when I was was growing up here, and again, this relates to a number of uh, young people, young men, black men who were growing up in Seattle, there weren't a great many uh, professional role models that were born here in Seattle and that went on and achieved uh, wonderful things like Homer had done. My family has been here for many years. My grandfather came here at the you know, turn of the century. And, and we were really proud of being black Seattleites. But here was a black Seattleite uh, who went on and, and is one of the top athletes ever to come out of a Seattle school system and you know, is a nationally renowned dermatologist. And he's one of our own. And so I, I've had this special affinity you know, toward Homer you know, because of that. And we're talking about you know, when he came out of Garfield, I think it was right around 19, 1934. And I think most people you know, who come to Seattle uh, you know, from, the 19, from 1950, I mean, they regard themselves as pioneers. I mean, <laughs> so the thing is, uh, there's no question about the fact. I mean, he's a, a pioneer in many ways in terms of uh, uh, you know, longevity, born, raised here in, in Seattle, and what he accomplished as a professional, what he accomplished as a wonderful athlete. And I always like to uh, call him, um, you know, a scholar, a scholar athlete. And people tend to forget that he was a scholar first. And uh, being an athlete was a means by which he was going to be able to accomplish, you know, his goals as one of the top dermatologists in this in this country, and it was a vehicle, you know, to get to where he he wanted to go. Absolutely, that's great. Um, <coughs> I'm going to ask you that question one more time. Mm-hmm. This time, what I'd like you to do, let me just check this real quick. Okay. This time, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to do that answer again, but I want like a, <laughs> make it really short. <laughs> <laughs> Six minute piece, so. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay. Well, let me let me see let me <laughs> see what I can do. Minor points. <laughs> okay. Well, if you could ask me, I forget. Uh, well, you, I think you uh, were probably right. I probably talked too long. I forgot the question. <laughs> 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 question was, uh, why does he deserve to be called uh, a black pioneer? Well, Homer Harris is a, a black pioneer in in many different ways. Uh, he was one of the top uh, uh, black athletes that see how come out of Seattle schools at the level that he was accomplishing so many things as an athlete. And so I, in that regard, he was a, a pioneer super athlete. And he also was a pioneer in terms of his scholarship. He excelled at, on every scholastic level uh, within the Seattle schools, within Garfield in particular. And then he went on and became one of the top uh, dermatologists in this, um, in this nation. And uh, the fact that he was, he came out of the Seattle schools, he was born and raised here in Seattle as a black man. Uh, he was the, one of the first top professionals you know, to accomplish all that he had done um, coming out of the Seattle schools. And so in that regard, certainly he was a pioneer. So he's a pioneer on, on many different levels. There's, there's no question about that. I got plenty of great sound bites out of that. Okay. Um, <coughs> okay. Why do you think uh, 
Why do you, why do you think he deserves to win that as far as winning that game? I mean, okay. before you answer that, this is no this is no small thing. You know, Most right. people have a park named after him after they're dead. Right. He's alive. Right. They had to waive that rule. Oh, they. Oh, they I see. They waived the rule. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that. So, um, <coughs> why why does he deserve that? The reason why Homer deserves to have a, a park named after him is because he excelled at, at so many different levels. Um, and we, when we think of parks, you know, we think of, uh, of athletics. And as I recall, there was a poll that was conducted back in the 1970s as a, in relation to the top athletes ever to come out of the Seattle schools, and he was named as one of the, as one of the top five. But the thing is, he not only was a top athlete, and this, I think this is what young people have to understand, young black men in particular have to understand, that he didn't just stop at being a fine athlete, that he went on and excelled as a scholar, he went on and excelled in his profession. So there aren't too many people, I think black or white, are going to be able to say uh, that they've accomplished things on the level that Homer Harris, you know, has accomplished you know, his uh, uh, variety of um, endeavors. Excellent. Uh, and this sort of tie, uh, well, I've forgotten the question. I have another question for it uh, that would go along with that. Um, is is Homer Harris is he a role model or a hero, and why? Or should he be? Might even be more of a, be a better question. But is he? And so whether or not uh, you know, Homer is a role model or a hero, um, uh, in, in my mind, there's no doubt about the fact that he, in fact, is. Now, I think uh, Homer would be a little bit embarrassed if you told him you know, that he was uh, one's hero. Um, but I can recall from the time I was a, a very young boy you know, all the way through you know, high school, college, and even in my adult life, you know, there's uh, very few times when I don't think about um, uh, what Homer, you know, has uh, has accomplished. It's, it certainly has um, has driven me to you know excel in whatever I've been able to do uh, within uh, within my lifetime. So he certainly is a is a hero to me, and there's no doubt about the fact that he's a hero specifically to a lot of uh, black men. And uh, no question about the fact that he should be a hero uh, for anybody, regardless of one's skin color. Excellent. Um, <coughs> and then you already answered my next question, was if you would tell Homer he was a hero role model, what do you think he'd say? Mm -hmm. You sort of answered that already. Right, yeah, so he, would, uh, he would push, he'd push it off. But th that's not to say he's, he's a very proud guy, and well, he knows he's- not over again then. Yeah. So if-, if uh, <coughs> If you were to ask, tell, if you were to tell Homer he was a hero or a role model, what would he say? Homer would not answer the question whether or not he regarded himself as a hero. But there's no question in my mind that Homer Harris is very proud of his accomplishments. He knows that he was a great athlete. He knows that he was a wonderful uh, physician, a wonderful dermatologist. There's no doubt in my mind about that. But he's not one, you know, to pound his own chest, to beat his own drum in terms of those accomplishments. You know, he knows within himself what he's accomplished. There's no question. He's very proud of the fact that a park was named after him. Um, but he doesn't go around, uh, you know, telling folks of what he's what he's done. I mean, it's a, it's really kind of an, an internal accomplishments that accomplishment that he feels very proud of. So we've talked about his accomplishments. We've talked about uh, his scholar, you know, that he's a scholar, that he's an athlete. Mm -hmm. So is Homer Harris a, a kind of, a, is he a good person? Is he a good sinner? I mean, is he just a, a good man? I mean, you know what I'm getting at? I'm right. Put everything aside. Is he, a, is he a good person? And his wife and his family, and they're, they're people that are 
my my experience of Homer is that there's clearly he is a he, he's a good person. Um, but you know, uh, there's no question about the fact that you know he's a human and 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 you know he has frailties. But I for one don't know what those frailties are. But um, the thing that I really respect about him is the fact that he is very direct in relation to um, how he views things. Um, he doesn't he doesn't beat around the bush. You, you pretty much know uh, how he feels about things. But at the same time, uh, in that regard, he's not you know I don't regard him as political or, or whatever. But um, he has a c you know, commanding presence. He speaks how he feels. Sometimes you won't, you may not agree with him, but he uh, you know he doesn't have any. Um, Reservations. He's in this uh, in this day and age of, of political correctness and so on. He's not um, an individual to uh, the one would regard as uh, as politically uh, politically correct. And that, in many respects, I think that's very refreshing. The fact that he is, is direct, speaks um, about how he feels on issues, and feels comfortable about what he uh, what he says about matters. Excellent. Um, <coughs> again, this is more. This is, this is more of it, and, and I, I'm asking you this because I, I really do want to get a variety, and so you'll, you'll get some of these things, but who is Homer, Homer Harris to you? Homer Harris to me is, a, is an individual that, that helped me to be able to set the goals, the standards, and targets within my lifetime, and that's something I, I don't think I've really told uh, you know Homer you know directly, um, but um, he's he's an individual that you know helped me kind of look back in terms of what I was uh, what I was doing in school, you know what I was doing in athletics, and. Um, you know, he gave me a, you know, he gave me, he set a standard for me. You know, he, uh, he set the bar for me. And uh, that's not to say that he was the only one, but there's no question about the fact that he had significant influence on um, what direction I wanted to go in life in terms of uh, uh, scholarship, uh, athletics, and, and my profession. I wouldn't doubt that, you know. He's the kind of person that would say that that, that that was more important to him than, than a lot of stuff, just to be sort of an example. I mean, you know. Yeah, people people wouldn't um, people might say, well, you know, you know, I don't see you know Homer at this community thing, or I don't see him down at the school board. I don't see him doing the thing. Is Homer? You know, he said things loud and clear by what he accomplished. And even though he may have had barriers uh, that were set before him, he would see ways in which he could get to where he wanted to go. He didn't let those, those barriers hinder him from getting to where he wanted to go. And so he's, he's not one that would um, say, woe is me, or gosh, you know, the world is against me uh, because I'm black or, or whatever. You know, he had a, a, a really fine sense of direction in terms of what he wanted to accomplish. And I mean that is, I mean his sense of uh, of determination was uh, is and is you know unbelievable. That's great. This is awesome. Um, <coughs> do you have any uh, like uh, meat? We answered how how has he inspired you to jump up or just get mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> do you have any uh, any neat story experiences that you might have you might have had about? Think of that kind of feel good moment? <laughs> well, uh, stories about about Homer, uh, there, there are many. There are a couple I recall when I was um, uh, living in different parts of the country. In fact, I, I, I worked for the Justice Department in Kansas City, Missouri. This is many years ago, back in the, uh, back in the late, late 60s. And um, I happened to be talking to an individual who was the um, assistant chief of police, about one of the, back in those days, one of the few black assistant chiefs of police in the entire country. This is Kansas City, Missouri. And, 
I was just talking to him about general things, and he asked where I was from, happened to be black. And uh, uh, he said, well, gosh, the only person I know in, in Seattle is a fellow then, named Homer Harris. And he would come stay at my house, you know, when I, when, and I, was, when I was growing up here. And he, uh, during the summertime, while he was going to medical school, he would come down and, you know, and stay at my place. You know, my family had all these wonderful uh, stories to, you know, to say about him. I mean, it was just a very small, small world in that regard. And, and I had another occasion when I was teaching uh, down in um, Florida State University in Tallahassee. Uh, this is back in the late 70s. Um, uh, I knew that Homer had coached, was an assistant coach at um, Florida A&M University many years you know, before he went into medical school. And I knew he worked under Jack Gaither, who is the legendary football coach down at Florida A&M, the Florida A&M Rattlers. And I saw him at a grocery store, uh, Jack Gaither. And, uh, I walked up to him. He didn't know who I was. And I said, well, I just want to say hello. My name is Carver Dayton. And uh, I understand that Homer Harris, you know, coach. He said, "Oh yes," he said. I remember Homer Harris. Uh, uh, he was a you know a fine you know coach for me. But I understand that boy went back to went back north and uh, became a doctor. He said, "Well, that that was really wonderful." But he called him a you know young man. He went back home. But uh, but just in your travels around the country, um, those are two experiences that uh, come to mind. That were were kind of fun that people had, you know, this, uh, these wonderful memories of, uh, of Homer many years ago. That's awesome. Um, <coughs> okay, and then this is the last, let's see, the yeah, second last question is for you. Okay, good question. <coughs> First question is, who do you think is Homer's best had influenced his life? Who do you think Homer would say that was a big influence to him in his life? In terms of those individuals had a big influence on, on Homer's life, um, he has not talked to me directly about that. But I, I would presume, yes, you know, being around his family, that both his uh, his mother and his father had you know significant influence uh, on his life. He volunteered, and I can't say whether or not he actually had influence on life, but, but my grandfather, John T. Gaten, lived uh, about three blocks you know, away from him, and he would tell me stories. He would bring them up to me. So I, you know, he said, I know, you know your, your grandfather, I knew your grandfather well, and we used to go out and play in front of his house, and he'd talk about the experiences he had in talking with my, with my grandfather. It's hard to say whether or not you know, he influenced them all. He was, happened to be a federal court librarian you know, for many years here in Seattle, but, but, uh, but in terms of those people who had the most significant influence on him, I don't think there's any question in my mind that it was his, uh, his parents. Excellent. That's mm -hmm. great. And that's, mm -hmm. that's what he said, too, by the way. Oh, is that right? That's a great question. Yeah. Okay. He said his mother mm -hmm. when I asked him that question. Yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. excellent. And so the, it's basically the only thing is that if there's anything, let me even pull out a little bit more on that, on that question. Is there anything... Uh, that you want to say that I might not have asked that might uh, tell a little bit about him. Hmm. I think something that probably sums up in a homer to a significant degree. I think um, that he knows uh, how much I admire him. But uh, he may very well be, you know, a little bit uneasy about me talking, you know, about him, and that's fine because I don't, I you know, I don't like to aggravate uh, Homer, but I'll, I'll aggravate him in this circumstance. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Uh, I heard that. No, turn the camera off for this. <coughs> off the record. Yeah. Off the record. I have heard a. Uh, do you want to just go right into this? Sure. Or do you want to go ahead. Question first. No, I. Okay. And this. Okay. You, so you're editing this. You already told absolutely. me. So some things you might have to rearrange. Okay. Absolutely. No problem. No problem. Um. <coughs> um. So. When I ask a question, uh, there's a, there's a couple of things we need to establish right off the bat. So when, if I ask the question, um, I need you to 
paraphrase your answer within my question, or my question within your answer. In other words, uh, if I say to you, you know, what color is the pig, you don't just say blue. The color of the, the pig is, yeah. the color of the pig is blue. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Something like that, because mm -hmm. they won't have, they won't handle it if you call them that. Oh, okay. So they don't have the skills or that thing. And uh, <coughs> uh, if, try not to say, as I told you before. Yeah, I, I, like I am aware that I should have <laughs> said <laughs> yeah, that. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, you've interviewed <laughs> but me. But if I do it, take it out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll try my best. <laughs> okay, I'll try not to give you a hard time with that. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's one of those things, it's really a selfish thing because I just don't want to, you know. Yeah, but that's embarrassing <laughs> to even do that. I mean, I've done that a time or two talking to people. It's, it's embarrassing. Okay, and the other thing is just basically you're looking at me and not the camera. So it's just yeah. a conversation between us. Okay. Okay, you ready? Right. Okay. And I have about 10 questions here. Okay. <coughs> First one's really hard. Okay, if I think of something, excuse me, <coughs> if I think of something that relates to a previous question, um, should I go ahead and I think you should, add should it. definitely go ahead and add it. Uh, try to reference it too when I try go back to, to it. it. <coughs> okay, so this one's really, really hard. Uh, I don't think you'll be able to handle this. But what is your name? How is it spelled? And how would you <laughs> like me to title you? <laughs> Esther. Paul Mumford, E S T H E R. Um, so much is funny. M U M F, as in Frank O R D. Um, I'm a research and writer on local African American history. You could say that. Or the author of Seattle's Black Victorians. I need to sell them, get rid of the rest of the books I've had 20 years. <laughs> 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 Seattle's Black Victorians, let's see, Calabash, I Calabash, a guide to the history, culture, and art of African Americans. Okay. Um, edited a series of transcripts called Seven Stars at Orion, editor of, Orion, of Seven Stars at Orion. <laughs> and a children's book, The Man Who Founded a Town. <laughs> You'll have to take some of that, you know, and do it. Okay. But I, I will probably go with... Uh, Well, the first Seattle's Black Victorians, yeah. and that puts me in the. Okay. So, okay. Author, uh, author Seattle's Black Victorians. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. I'll do that. Because that's how, or, Cal well, you don't want to add Calabas, but if you did, that's sort of in the mm -hmm. context of what we were talking about. Okay. Um, so, you wouldn't describe yourself as a historian? I don't do that because the PhDs like to have it all to themselves, and I don't have that, those okay. graduate degrees. And I don't care. I do the work, and they just talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have a problem with it. Okay, cool. Well, I just want to make sure, because yeah. I don't want anybody to make any mistakes. Okay. No. People do refer to me, oh, she's an eminent historian. She's an yeah, acclaimed yeah, historian. Yeah. I, you know, I never have said it, told anybody I was a historian, because <laughs> I just say, you know, I don't, I, I've been in organizations with these people. I don't care about this title. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Okay. So now I know what to call you. Um, All right. <coughs> can you describe uh, Maddie Vineyard Harris to me? She was a remarkable woman. She was. Stop that now. You started out with two words. I don't uh, know. Oh, no. That. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Maddie Vineyard Harris was a remarkable woman. She's a mother of Homer Harris, the dermatologist, now retired, who lived and worked in Seattle, was born here. She was born here. She was born here in 1894 uh, at, a at a time when Seattle had not become the city that it was to become. She sort of grew up with the city, and um, she saw the changes. She saw the growth. She loved the city. She was a very devout woman, very committed to her faith. I met her in her 80s, and she had a tremendous garden at the time, a vegetable garden. She told me one day, I'll get to that garden even if I have to crawl. The garden, I think it was therapy for her perhaps, but it was also a source of food for the needy. And she was very committed to raising as much food as she could, could on her land to help with hunger in Seattle. She was 
politically aware. She was, I would call her a feminist even. She was very concerned with women's work and life and I think that had come about because her mother, from the time that she was about four, her mother had raised her and her brother and sister alone, and she knew how hard women work to keep families together, and she was very interested in that. Um, when I did my research in writing for Seattle's Black Victorians, I remember asking her, about men's work and asking her to read some of what I had written to make sure I got it right. And she was very concerned about women's work and she made that clear to me that she was concerned about that. So um, I think her sensitivity, it was an admirable sens sensitivity and I think it, it came about because of her growing up at a time when her mother had become the chief breadwinner. Excellent. Um, <coughs> what did she say, I'm gonna get straight to some of the stuff so uh, I'll bounce around a little bit, I'm oh. sure. But uh, <coughs> um, what did she say about having her son become a doctor? Maddie Harris, I've said she was a very bright woman. When she was growing up, her one desire was. I want to get this very clear, and I think our next person probably. I knew that I was getting into the heart of things. I knew I better stop before we before we get into that. <laughs> That'd be so awesome. And we'll, we'll get right to you. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> you know, I'm settled down here. So when Sonia walks away, I guess that's all. <laughs> that's fine. Oh yeah, is that who that yeah, is? That I haven't really seen is. her for a while. <laughs> Good woman. She knows Miss Harris very well. I'm yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Good friend too. Say something. Okay. <coughs> you know, I've mentioned her garden. I, I, I want to put oh, this yeah. on the end of it. Um, she was. I I met women in the seventies, older women, then retired, most of them, who recalled wonderful. Um, wonderful tea parties and um, Sunday evening teas and parties in Mrs. Harris's rose garden. So she, she also kept a beautiful rose garden. She had a beautiful uh, ornamental garden as well as a vegetable garden. But the vegetable garden in her late years was extremely important to her. Excellent. Um, <coughs> so I, I, I'd like to know uh, what she said about the importance, I guess, and about her son becoming a doctor. When Mrs. Harris's son, Homer Harris, was in medical school, he came home for, it was either vacation or Christmas time, and he said to her, whose idea was it that I become a doctor? <laughs> and she thought that that was the silliest question that she had ever heard because she had wanted to be a doctor when she was a young girl. She grew up in p poor circumstances, and it was just not possible for her to become a doctor. But she always had in her mind that she would have, I think she told me, two sons, and one of them would be a doctor. And so when her son Homer asked the question, whose idea was it that I become a doctor, she was just 
completely astonished at the question, she said, because it had been in the house all the time of his growing up. She had the one son. He became a doctor. <laughs> Do you know anything about, uh, I don't know if Dr. read this in your, so you might not, and this is the Dr. Kennedy, because I don't remember exactly where I read it, but I read somewhere where they used to actually call Homer Doc. Doc. Did she mention that? In she mentioned that in the conversation. Um, I think some of his friends, even when he was in high school, some times referred to him as Doc, and people in the community apparently referred to him as Doc. It was very well known. However, I, it wasn't just an automatic um, supposition that he would become. She was, I think she really talked about it a lot and um, groomed him for it. She thought, it, she thinks, she thought it was important for parents to influence their children, to, to make as much information possible to their children about choices and to support those choices. And um, also I think she felt that if you had a, a desirable profession that you would like to see a child enter, that you, you managed to inculcate that somehow, and she did manage to do that. It was in the, pr in the house all the time, she said. I'd like to do that question again, <coughs> and this time I'd like to take out a couple of sheets and throw in a couple of Maddie, a couple of names, or, oh, or okay. his mother. Or his mother, know, all right. Kind of reference okay. to who she is. Okay. So the question was, again, um, what was the question? Do you remember? Yeah, the question was, how, what did she think about a son becoming a doctor? Oh, how no, did she no. Did they, did they, uh, I heard something about the, they used to call him Doc. Oh, Doc. Oh, yeah. okay. And if you can't do it. Okay. Uh, yes, I think she did mention, th I think his mother mentioned, Mrs. Harris mentioned that uh, kids at school called him Doc, even when he was in high school playing football. Uh, the, some of the community people referred to him as Doc. So. Whether or not she told people she wanted him to become a doctor or whether he, by that time, had come to uh, think of himself as going to medical school, I don't know, but certainly by the time he was in high school, according to his mother's recollection, people were aware that he was going to become a doctor or that he was going to go to medical school. Excellent. Very good. Very good. Um, I can cut. Okay, <laughs> you'll have to. Uh, I'm not very good at coming directly to the point either. I should have warned you about that. <laughs> Go all around the mulberry bush. <laughs> um, do you think that his mother, and I don't know if you can answer this question or not, but it, do you think that his mother, and I think maybe you already have, but maybe you can answer it a different way. Do you think that his mother influenced him or guided him towards the success that he has had in his life? And what brings you to that, to that con conclusion? Mrs. Harris was a woman of conviction. She was a woman who believed in herself. She was a woman who believed in her, her son and her family. And I think she was very influential in shaping the person that her son became. I think from the time he was a very young child, instilling, instilling certain values in him that are desirable for um, an ethical person were instilled at home by his mother, Mrs. Harris. I think uh, she was able to inculcate the idea of his becoming a physician in him at home. Um, what did you, what, 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 what no. did you say about you the know question? What? That was perfect. Um, the question was, uh, um, <coughs> do you think that his mother uh, influenced him or guided him towards the success that he had in his Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you were gonna say that you believe it was somewhere around that you believe that the the values that, uh, and I'm using my own words, the values that 
mother and father had were yielded to him, basically. Is that uh, summation of what, what I think she said. Okay. So Do I need to say it again? I would love for you to say it again because it's a good recording. <laughs> okay. <coughs> I think the values that Mr. and Mrs. Harris held were instilled in their son Homer when he was a, from the time he was a small child. And he grew and developed those as he matured. Okay. You'll um, have to add it on. Huh? <laughs> You'll have to add it on. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I you know the short that the short answers are really good. Oh, okay. Are really good. So, um, I think that's great. And and the, what you said before was just fine too. And I'll probably go with what you said before. And now I have a variation. Okay. Um. <coughs> um. Can we talk a little about 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 what? The, the climate at the time, at the time, I, I mean, obviously, not the necessarily the time where Homer Harris grew up, or the time of the practice, but before then, um, like, like the... Like the when his mother was growing up, yeah, or... Yeah, just, just, I guess what I'm, what I'm looking for is, <coughs> um, what kind of job that did black people have, and what kind of, you know, what kind of stuff did they have to do? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say something about that. Homer Harris's mother, Maddie Vineyard Harris, was born in Seattle in 1894. At that time, there were very few African Americans in Seattle. She grew up in the lower Queen Anne Interbay area, and there were even fewer African Americans living in that area. There were some, but very, very few. And I asked her about that, and she told me that people tended to relate to each other more on the basis of economics than of race at that time. Th uh, Seattle came into the Union with a constitution which had a fair, uh, which had a public accommodations or uh, clause in it, and this was the 1890 Constitution, which was promulgated at a time when much of the South was enacting Jim Crow laws. Now, I'm not saying that you could walk in any restaurant or saloon or barber shop and be served, because that certainly was not the case. There are enough recorded incidents of people uh, taking exception to the way they were treated or that law not being observed, court cases and whatnot, for me to know that uh, African Americans were not treated the same as white people were. But they tended to, they lived in a lot, in various places around the city wherever they could afford to live. And I remember Mrs. Harris telling me, particularly after her mother became the sole breadwinner, that um, you moved further away from town as the rents were raised. And she was also, uh, she, w she was a toddler when the d Great Depression of the 90s crashed down on the country, and it was felt very deeply here. Um, so they were, they were poor probably because her mother was heading household, but also because the country was in dire straits at that time. Jobs were never available across the board to African Americans. You were more or less restricted to manual labor. You could work in, as a porter. You could work as a waiter. Um, sometimes you could dig ditches and work on the streets sweep the streets. Usually this was men's work. By that time there were African American miners in King County Mines, Southeast King County, in Franklin, and Newcastle, later in uh, Ravensdale. Uh, this, there were 
a number of miners in Kittitas County across the Cascades, and Roslyn and Ronald. But for the most part, work was very hard to come by, and so people were always looking for work. And women usually at that time did not work out of their homes as long as th there was a man in the, ha in the home to, to work. I believe she told me her father was a porter in a saloon. And that was pretty typical for African Americans. People tended to own property, and they began owning property, African Americans began owning property in Seattle from 1850, about 1852, I think, with the first settler, Manuel Lopes, when he came, he owned property on First Avenue South and um, operated a barber shop and a restaurant and rented beds. And other men who followed him in the 1860s had similar businesses. They were in small businesses and um, things like barber shops, bath houses, restaurants and hotels. It was a kind of businesses that they entered into and pursued until the end of the territorial years. Uh, if you did not work for yourself, however, and as the, as we came nearer to, as the time came nearer to statehood, there were more African Americans here, and um, a lot of them were out of work much of the time. Of course, in the 90s, you had an awful lot of white men who didn't have work because of the Depression. And so life was really very difficult for people generally unless they had flourishing lumber businesses, say, or were involved in the railroad somehow. But it was pretty hard. However, I do remember her saying that in the 90s particularly, and after the turn of the century when her mother was heading house her household, you, di you, you couldn't starve here because there was a lot of food that could be gathered. Her brother had a dugout. He would go out and before he went to school, he would catch three or four salmon. And so she said there was always plenty to eat, but you would get very hungry for other things or for certain things, and they just weren't available because you didn't have the money or that her family had, did not have the money to do that. In terms of housing, uh, African Americans owned property at immense tracts of land in various places in Seattle, on Beacon Hill, at Green Lake, um, on Capitol Hill. This is from the 1860s. There came a time, however, after her marriage, it was very interesting that she mentioned it to me, that there was an attempt to expel black people from the neighborhood where she lived, north of Madison Street. And I have since encountered uh, uh, other attempts to evict or expel people of color, and I will expand that from the African American to Chinese in particular. I know of one man whose father was quite affluent, a merchant here. He was, the son was in China, the father died, and the son came to Seattle and lived in the home that the father had purchased and um, constructed. I believe that was in the um, Montlake neighborhood, or in that area, it was north of where Mrs. Harris lived anyway, between her and the university district. And he spoke some years after this happened and again, I don't know when it happened. I think it was during the years of World War I, possibly uh, spanning that period of our involvement in World War I. When the attempt was made, petitions were carried to expel him. I was quite surprised to see that. Uh, so I know that it was not just African Americans, but people of color. And then, and, and, and even as early as 1909, I remember there was a group of uh, black people who lived on houseboats. Um, in the Portage Bay area, and there was an attempt because Montlake was, people were beginning to look at that as an ideal spot to uh, locate housing, nice housing. And so um, a letter was written, I believe, to the city council. I, I'm not positive about that, but I know that there was a letter written concerning these African Americans who were living on houseboats in 1909 because they were not desirable tenants. Seattle was gearing up for the First World's Fair and uh, people were trying to develop the Montlake neighborhood and they did not want African Americans there. 
and they, they considered it a problem. Then about 1923, um, the housing restrictive covenants became prevalent. You would see those um, in various neighborhoods. African Americans were not to be sold property north of, I believe it was Denny on Capitol Hill, for instance. Um, so it was, it was a problem in terms of uh, who you were and, and where, you, where, you could, where you could live without harassment. Now Mrs. Harris and, and her husband could see, and her white neighbors, some of whom were carrying the petitions around, could see petitions being carried from house to house. Oh, she said to me, they were buzzing like bees from house to house. You could see them. They were, going to, they were trying to get us out of here, is what she told me. So she was very much aware of that. And um, there were uh, white people who interested themselves in it. I remember one um, professor at the University of Washington, and um, he took an interest in it. And he came to her and let her know that he was against it. And if they wanted to um, look into it in terms of the legalities, he was willing to donate time to that. But there was that campaign. And as a result of that, I think uh, it spread from her neighborhood in Capitol Hill and various neighborhoods throughout the 20s. That was the time when the, these covenants were introduced very broadly in, in Seattle and other places. And um, they were written. I have one. I, I bought one several years ago. <coughs> and I had to buy the whole collection, but I, I wanted the covenant, so I bought it. And it, the wording, I can't recall exactly, but it does include the exclusion or um, the agreement which was to be signed by the, by, by the, cell, by the neighbors or the residents of, a, of certain communities that they would not sell property to persons of the African, Malay, and Hebrew races, I believe it says. Um, Malay, I think, was referring to Filipinos, and um, they, were exclude, they did exclude other Asian groups as well. In some cases, I think people from Southern and Eastern Europe, probably Italians, were excluded from certain areas. They wanted, uh, I remember someone saying, the best people to live in these neighborhoods. Understood. Okay. That's great. Actually, you answered a lot of questions in that that I had about that. So <coughs> that was very good. I didn't, I didn't take it necessarily that way. That's wonderful. Um, requires a, 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 it's probably be a good good one not a very long answer on this one because I'm not going to use much of it probably um, were there a lot of was there a lot of racial tension but when is when your history in where I mean it, it's, it's 1901, 1901 for for Victorians mm -hmm. for Calabash it's up to the present day but I don't it's it's really a guide to places and okay. events more than there is history in it though but so you, you probably know a little bit about this, I guess. Well, I'll see if I can answer it. Okay. Um, was there a lot of racial tension, let's say, let's say 1933-ish, um, or was it more like a, you knew your boundaries kind of thing, or did you, you just didn't say much? You know? I think for Seattle, in the, in, in, in the uh, most of the 20th century, it was that uh, African Americans knew their boundaries. They had begun their uh, suits um, uh, discrimination suits against public people who operated public um, places in the ni in the early 90s, and they continued through the 20s and 30s. But increasingly, people just said, "Oh, what's the use?" I remember in the 90s when there was a lawyer here by the name of James Hawkins who took case after case of discrimination in restaurants, bars, and whatnot, and the, the, the damages, he, usually because the law was on the book, you see, that you were to be admitted, he would win the case, but the damages were insultingly small, one dollar, say. And finally, a, a reporter said to him, 
why do you always take these cases? I mean, you're getting these piddling amounts of money for this, um, these infractions. And he looked at the report and he said, it's not the damages we are after, it's the principle. And so he continued to take the cases the rest of his life. But in by the 30s, when um, Homer Harris was becoming a young man, I can't say that there was a lot of obvious tension 